Warning, it is the opinion of the Forestry Productions LLC and the Working Perspectives podcast that we should inform you that some of the language used in this recording could possibly be considered offensive. You have been warned, so if you decide to listen to the recording, then don't complain about the language. Thanks for stopping by. So we're going to talk to some real people about some real things and real lives, doing real stuff. This is the Working Perspectives Podcast. I'm Matt Lavelle, accompanied today by the one and only Rich Lada. In case you're wondering, you can find all our stuff and all our content and all podcast platforms and YouTube at Working Perspectives Podcast. You can us on Instagram at Working Perspectives Podcast. You can join us on the Twitter and the Tiki Talk, the Working P Pod. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, please email us at workperspectivesgmail.com. And please like and subscribe so we can keep this party going. Rich, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Well, speaking of being ready, this is the Working Perspectives Podcast. Let's get this thing started. Let's go. It's our objective to be effective by voice in society's working perspective. Exploring your day and how you get paid. Launching a new episode every Tuesday. Your day can transform while we inform. So check out our vibe and how we get live Then do us a solid Share and subscribe What you sharing? What you sharing? What you sharing? Working perspectives So on the show today, we have the owner, operator, and proprietor of the Hensler Gracie PA Academy in Hatfield, Rich Lada. You've seen him on an episode before with Sydney Outlaw, an episode available now on all podcast platforms and YouTube at Work Perspectives Podcast. Rich, thanks for being on the show. Uh, pleasure. Pleasure. So Super first exciting. thing I wanted to ask you, you do it, like we said, you own and operate the Hensler Gracie PA Academy in Hatfield, PA. Link will be in the description of this episode. Check us out. Uh, what got you interested in mixed martial arts initially? As a kid, mm -hmm. movies, of course, magazines, yeah, loved it. it. Was that and bodybuilding, fitness type, yeah. So that was that's what got me interested. Bodybuilding was everything back then. Oh yeah, because oh, you could look at Stallone and Arnold and all those guys. They were and Van Dam, Van, Vander Holyfield was another. People didn't realize that he was a bodybuilder. They started out in bodybuilding. No kidding. Yeah, I mean he was. Yep. Get it. Yep. I tell you, he might be the best cruiserweight of all time. Oh yeah. So okay, so you're watching these movies and you're seeing like. These things like Bruce Lee and all these stuff, but honestly, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu really wasn't popular in American culture back then. Even in like an entertainment standpoint, it was more karate based and things yep. like that. So, what was your first experience? Because Brazilian Jiu Jitsu hadn't really transitioned to the United States yet, what was your first experience with combat sports in general, i.e., wrestling, boxing, karate, anything like that? Um, again, I think the movies, mm -hmm. entertainment world, kind of brought light to it. Yeah. You know, Bruce Lee, of course, Chuck Norris movies, yeah, yeah. liked all that. Yeah. Um, even the Karate Kid, even yeah. the Karate Kid, yeah. right? Um, then you had some of the Steven Seagal movies later sure, on, kind sure. of brought a different perspective of, <laughs> yeah. of, of martial arts, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so I think all of the above. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you just wanted. So then, did you seek out which one? Did you seek out first? Like what? What? Uh, what discipline was your? First I, one? I I initially started out training in Shotokan. Okay. Um, a Japanese art. Okay. So you see a lot of uh, Dutch kickboxing. Mm -hmm. um, they use Western boxing and a lot of it, a lot of those schools over there in the Netherlands have Japanese names. Yeah. Um, and a lot of uh, their kicking style comes from that and and Thai boxing. Oh wow. So uh, more the power end of it and, and the low kicks from more the Thai end of it. Yeah. A lot of the high kicks and the way they set them up, like they call it the question mark kick. It looks like a like a push kick, a front yeah, kick. Yeah, and yeah. A lot of that you started to see in like K1 and Glory. And that's more your Japanese style. Okay. Uh, fast, snappy. Um, Misdirection sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Yo, 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 I'll tell you, there's some big sons of bitches in the Netherlands, man. You yeah, get yeah. them throwing kicks. And you see, you've seen like, um, 
in the UFC, like Machida. Mm -hmm. But you see, if you look, if you follow Bellator, yeah, you look at a lot of Middle Eastern, uh, Eastern European, yeah. Russian, all have that same type of movement that comes from traditional martial arts. Yeah, along with a lot of them have good wrestling backgrounds. Yeah, so you see that elusiveness from that and that's why you see a lot of dutch kickboxing as far as their striking end of it mm. a lot of them came up doing traditional martial arts yeah more that japanese style yeah. some taekwondo some korean style but mostly a japanese style but that elusive footwork yeah. and movement that in out and uh not so much angles but more that in and out on your toes very very elusive very mm. quick it's almost like playing tag yeah um yeah. hit not get hit yeah, yeah, yeah kind of the idea right yeah strike and move and then return yep yeah, yeah, yep, yeah. yep. you see with the dutch you start to see more angles mm -hmm. um and that comes more from western boxing mm -hmm. you know you're not just standing in front and catching every yeah you know you're getting out getting off on those angles and setting up your next combo it's so you see the blend of the show yeah it is crazy too like when you go back and you look at i was like when when you know when i really started to dig in the history of boxing and things like that you do see like the european style the military style the u.s conventional style mm -hmm. right where it's like there is so it's 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 very different, but it's almost the mindset of it's different in a way where it's like if you're going to do European style, it's front foot, toes forward. You're coming straight in yep. at him. Military, it's kind of up and in like yep, a yep, Joe yep, Frazier yep, kind yep, of. Yep. And then, you know, the U.S. style, it's you're in and out. You're popping in and out, returns. Well, I slipping. think I, I, maybe it was Rocky three or four yeah. when they saloon out on the West Coast yeah. training at the gym. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And you started to see that style flat-footed just rolling to more up on your toes yeah more elusive yeah really pumping away with that jab using that for offense judging distance defense yeah um and, and you started to see that there there's you know it's just like anything else there's different styles mm -hmm. and different footwork and 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 sometimes when you start like that west coast had a lot of that big time um you know uh muhammad ali made it very famous <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and, oh yeah, oh yeah, big time. And and you know, you're you're exactly right. And the thing is, with mixed martial arts and and combat sports in general, they all kind of it's all like you know they make it the it, it's forever evolving, right? It is, mm -hmm. it is. So you're seeing footwork, um, taken from some of it from martial arts, yeah, and 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 being applied, um, to boxing and kickboxing. Mm -hmm. You know, it derived from somewhere, yeah, right. And then yeah. I go body types. All right. So when you're coming up and I know we've talked about this, you and me personally, you've done, you did some karate, taekwondo, I think it was. No, and, no, not, not oh. taekwondo. I did uh Shotokan yep. karate. Yep. And then also you wrestled as well, right? I did in uh junior high. Okay. And then, so you would do, you know, wrestling, basic things like that. But what would you say was your first introduction to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? Um, mid nineties, like yeah. 95. Yeah. Where were we at? Um, it's actually a friend ended up meeting somebody that was already training, introduced me to come over for a training session. And then yeah. the rest was history. Yeah. yeah that yeah. was it. I loved it. Yeah, um, yeah. I thought it was, I was fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. Um, years ago I did get exposed when, when I was training in Shotokan, a guy came from judo. Yeah. And, um, there was, you had more of the traditional sport judo, and then they had this combat judo, which had allowed some submissions, mm -hmm. uh, straight arm bars were one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I remember him showing me a straight arm bar and I was like, I was, he was like a brown belt, but he came over and started doing show to come. Yeah. Um, and I was fascinated by it. Yeah. Cause I was yeah. like, holy shit, that freaking hurt. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it, it got my interest. Um, uh, after high school, I had, um, looking for more uh different types of martial arts to train in uh, a friend of mine there was a wrestling sambo club in philadelphia copman in frankfurt okay um gordon aldi was his name and he was one of the one of two coaches here in america that actually taught russian sambo yeah so um invited me down and i loved it and i would go down there and train down there so they had uh they would run different clinics freestyle the collegiate wrestling and then they would have Sambo there. Yeah. So that was my introduction to um, submission grappling, a different approach. Yeah. You know, it was different than jujitsu. I remember when we had Padilla on the show 
And that episode's available now on all podcast platforms and YouTube at Work Perspectives Podcast. But we had Fadia on the show. He had said he, you know, he talked about how he wrestled and things like that. His first ju- Brazilian Jiu Jitsu session, he's went in. He's like, I got my. He's like, I went in thinking, you know, I was good at wrestling. I'm gonna whoop all these yeah. old guys' ass. <laughs> went in there, got his ass whipped, and was like, this is for me. Yep. You know, yep. and I feel like is that kind of a similar thing where it's like you went in there, maybe not got, like you know, you didn't go in there get ragdoll yep. or anything, but you went in there like this is. Incredible. Yeah, I went in there with an open mind, but sure. yeah, thinking I, I could probably hold my own, at least stall them out. Yeah. And I was sadly mistaken, but it, it actually, <laughs> that's everybody. what intrigues you. You're yes. like, what is going on here? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, you know, almost 30 years later, you you look back at that and go, wow, how naive. But it was yeah. interesting. Yeah. And even the different styles of uh, of grappling, Sambo versus Jiu Jitsu. Mm-hmm. Um, you can see some of the relations uh, yeah. that it has, uh, and then you can see some of the differences. Um, like I remember training at a time I was still a white belt in jujitsu, mm-hmm. but going down and training and and in the sambo class, and the guy ended up literally putting me into half guard from the top position. I was in the bottom position. <laughs> And he had come around me and he actually took my leg and put me in half guard. <laughs> that is odd. Like yeah. what, what are you doing? Bro? But they want to stay connected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was the difference. Yeah. And I thought that was that was that was odd. It was different because obviously if you've passed someone's legs, why would you want to yeah, why would you want to hang out? Why yeah, would yeah. you put yourself back into that position? But they they looked at it differently. So it gave you a different interest, but a different sport, different rules. Yeah. And just like jujitsu, they have their no gi end of it. Mm-hmm. And they have their gi end of it. So it's a instead of a, a gi that they would wear as a top and pants, they would wear a kirka. Okay. So the uh the, the understanding is with the with the jacket on, more like judo. Oh, I see. so it actually had little um ledges on the sleeve and it was meant for grabbing and throwing. Oh, I see. Okay. And then the other version would be in a singlet, like mm-hmm. wrestling. Yeah. So more freestyle yeah. based, almost like catch wrestling. Got so, and, yeah. so it's a combination of catch wrestling and freestyle yeah. with submissions. Okay. And then there were certain submissions that were allowed and other ones that weren't. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they had a military version of it, which yeah. was pretty much everything goes. So actually three versions of Sambo. Okay. And if you look at jujitsu, you got more of your MMA style. Yep. You got more of your traditional style with the gi, and then you have your no gi end of it. Um, and then you, that splits into uh, a submission say, only. Would you even say too, like you're saying three, maybe out of fourth for like street style too, right? Like, cause you guys do incorporate, I know here and a lot of other places do incorporate like in a street self street, street fight situation, kind no, that, of. That, that's actually under more the traditional end of it. Oh, okay. So traditional jujitsu covers self defense. Yeah, 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 that's all part of that basic. You're learning basic self defense. Yeah. Um, I it. think actually, gi jujitsu mm-hmm. and all the fundamentals and basics apply to uh, self defense. I wouldn't. It doesn't really. It's not really sport. Sport. You can apply it for sport, but definitely for self defense. If you see uh, a lot of guys who compete in MMA, a lot of them are your traditionalists. They came up in the gi, learned the gi, um, and you can see a difference. Like they're solid. It takes longer, but it's way more technical. And, um, you know, you got more submissions. You got some more stuff to get, you know, to be aware of. You're not going to slip out of an arm bar in the gi. You don't know how to get out or you don't know how to get out. (laughs) The same thing with chokes. You got a piece of cloth choking you. So I think it actually makes you better. There's some people that say, now I never trained in the gi. I'm fine, but I just go look at your last Dobby Dobby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there might be guys at the top of the echelon. They're doing more no gi now, but they're they're good gi guys too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Versus somebody who's never trained in the in the gi. You know, you look like I said. You look at the last Dobby Dobby. Yeah. You know they're they they kind of fell short. I just think you got guys that now are solid in the gi, solid no gi, and they can put a set of gloves on and, and yes. convert that into MMA. Yeah. So that's dangerous. I yeah. think, yeah, now you're, they're very complete all the way around. They might choose to do more no gi because that's where they're get, making the most amount of money as a professional. Mm-hmm. Um, would you say though, I mean, I feel like this, if you're going to, in, in this time, in this context, when speaking of gi versus no gi, I would say that it is important to learn the gi just because it's more arrows in your quiver, man. Yep. You know, you don't like, Hey, maybe you might, a lot of people prefer no gi yep. to gi and that's fine. But if you're going to learn the sport, you need to learn all aspects of it. And it just helps you when you're like, you know, because you have to learn to trust yourself and trust your instincts. And it opens you up to more more avenues that you can go down, even if you primarily do no gi. Yes, absolutely. I yeah. think at a certain point you should train at least up to a purple belt level in the gi. Yeah. 
Um, and then you're gonna you're gonna easily transfer over to Nogi without any problems. If you take a Nogi guy mm-hmm. and say he gets to maybe a purple belt level, so somebody three to five years training, yeah. right? And that's training four days a week, five days a week, right? Yeah. Um, and you go to put a gi on them, they're gonna be lost. Yeah, completely lost. Yeah. If you take a gi guy and he takes the gi off and goes into no gi, it's going to take him a couple of days to make the adjustment. Here's the difference. And I actually learned this from Hodger Gracie training with him. He was a brown belt at the time at the New York Academy. And Henzo had asked me to train with him after class. Yeah. And it was his first time. She can kind of remember. She was up there. <laughs> it was his first time training no gi. I had no idea who he was. Yeah. I, he was young. Uh, he had some acne on his face. He was with his <laughs> 16 year old girlfriend. Yeah. And oh yeah, <laughs> and Henzo was like, oh, "Can you try?" It? I didn't think nothing of it. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, no problem. I'll take it easy on him. And Henzo smiled. Yeah, yeah. And then I, made him, I think I was like thirty-two at the time. Yeah. And um, how old are you? Like Eighteen or uh, he was seventeen. Seventeen. He was seventeen. God, what really? a handful! I was oh. like, "Holy shit!" Yeah. So I didn't get done the whole thing, and I yeah. remember asking him, "Like, what? You, the first time at Nogi?" Like, what was the difference? He goes, being able to judge a different. Usually I have a sleeve. Yeah. I have the material. He goes, I realized I had to use my legs more. Mm-hmm. And that was a 17-year-old. Old. Yeah. And he, look at, look, I mean, the guy, I mean, probably the most accomplished and uh, incredible. And he was incredible then. Like yeah. I said, it was, holy shit. It was an eye opener. <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't, he's not near the size he is now. Yeah. Um, but that's but, one thing I'll tell you. Eat, leave the ego at the door, brother. That, yeah, when you're yeah. coming to this thing. That's one thing that you learned quick, but let's talk about this. So like you said, you would, you, you would mention that you would go up to New York and train up there. So you would, you would just start, you got kind of a taste for jujitsu down here. When did you want to escalate your training and go up to New York? And how did you even hear about that? Again, another friend, Henzo okay. had just opened up that academy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and would you say at this time, sorry to interrupt, but Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is just kind of getting into America at this time. Like UFC yeah. had introduced Hoist Gracie to the world. Yep. So everyone's like, whoa, what is this Brazilian mm-hmm. Jiu-Jitsu thing? And then once you hear another Gracie name, is yep. that kind of, yep. okay. You're talking 96 or 97. Oh, wow. In really that, early. Really early. Yeah. And he had opened up that academy. Mm-hmm. And again, another friend training up there. Um, he would already been with Henzo at his other academy. And, um, you know, that's that was kind of the gateway prior to that. Uh, had had met him at a uh, at a tournament also. Mm-hmm. And uh, had spent some time talking to Karen. Oh, okay. And that kind of, hey, they got the invite to come up okay. with our friend. Yeah. And so, then the rest is kind of history. Okay, at that so point. you were competing, and when you were competing, you run into everybody all over the sport, mm, yep. and then they're like, "Hey, this guy's opening up up here," and you're like, "All right, I'm yeah." In. He actually, he actually, Henzo actually had talked to, to Karen. Okay, your wife Karen. Yeah, 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 yeah. my wife Karen. Yep. Yeah. So, and so I was competing, and he had talked to her, and then she was telling him, um, you know what what we were doing, and he's like, "Oh, come on up," and we we knew a student of his already. And long story short, that's how we ended up up there. Okay. And then I realized I went up there and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like everybody was good. Ooh, yeah. Man. Everybody was good. I was like, holy shit. This is a, and super nice. Yeah. But white belt up the black belt. Like there it was, it wasn't even yeah. that many black belts. There yeah. was more purple belts. They were like the black belts back then, but everybody was good. And I was like, uh, and the way he instructed, I felt was very easy to learn. Yeah, it was very uh, down to earth. That's it his wasn't confusing even now, though. Oh yeah, no, he makes jujitsu fun and simple. Mm-hmm. It should be jujitsu for dummies. <laughs> yeah. You know, I trained with other people, and hey. I felt like, wow, this is a very complicated art. Yeah, like it. You can, you know, I mean, you've been training a while now. You can see, and I think it comes down to the person passing that information off. Yes. Um, and and that kind of. You know, you can either complicate or you can make it simple. Yeah. And I always go, think of what makes a, a Glock pistol and an AK so popular. Reliability. Yes. It's the same thing. Yeah. You know, he makes it simplified. This is what you need to be concerned with. And even the gi, I remember him at a point I was like kind of struggling between gi and no be- gi making the transition. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I was fumbling a little bit. And he's like, just train the same. Don't get confused. Pay attention to the collar a little bit, but you can use a lot. You don't have to use the sleeve grips and the pant leg grips as much. You can still just grab. Yeah. 
as you feel more comfortable, you can start utilizing that yes. more in your game. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay. You know, you're trying to be so technically correct. Mm -hmm. And when you're training or competing, you know, as you know, from boxing too, like you want to try and have the best technique and the best yes. perfection, right? Yes. But when the heat of the moment, you're getting tired, things start to get a little sloppy and fall apart. That's why you always train for perfection and make things correct. Mm -hmm. Because as you get tired, you know, things could kind of fall apart. You're going to go back on just what the body knows. Yes. You need your instincts. You need your muscle memory. Absolutely. Yeah. You're not thinking about how good does the, the technique look yes. or is it, is it yeah. correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes, you know, the heat of the moment, you make adjustments and it worked. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's just through good training and good and, and good teaching. Yeah. Well, I would say, too, one of the things that you focus on and all the other instructors here, and I bet you got this from Henzo, and it, and it, and it amazes me because this happens every session where it's it's one little thing. Yep. Right? You're going over a move or doing something, and you're like, God damn it, this just doesn't feel – right and you're like oh just move your hand an inch over or like even yesterday or the other day we were going over that pass mm -hmm. right and i had the my hand s, in between the like s leg right yep. like s in between yep. like and i'm grabbing on top of the knee and you told me no cup underneath it and i was like this fucking changes yeah. that and it was a th my move my hand three inches yep. and it changed everything and i was like oh my god sometimes you gotta watch like i used to watch henzo when he taught too and it would be some of the little things and i would ask him afterwards and um he goes no no that's that's correct sometimes you just gotta watch you know as i'm talking i might be adding steps yeah. just so everybody gets it you slow it up a little yeah, bit yeah but if you're paying attention and as i'm speaking you're gonna see because obviously when you start blending it together there's steps that get you throw out yeah 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 you know to make it complete um you know so, yeah, no, even breaking it down like that, I couldn't agree more. Would you say, so I want to hear this though. So you're living here in the Hatfield, you know, PA, Lansdale, mm -hmm. PA area, and you're going to New York. What was the training schedule like? Like, what was your schedule like? Tired. Like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it's a two hour drive yeah. and you're going to the city. Oh. So that's two hours if you get lucky with traffic. So about, about an hour and a half. So it would be the uh, bus. Okay. Get the, the bus at the charcoal diner. Okay. And uh, I would sleep on the way there. Yeah. Get off the Port Authority. His first school was on 37th and 8th. So you walk three blocks. Okay. And train. Mm -hmm. And then when you're done, I would sleep on the way home. So it's an hour and a half. So you would sleep on the way home and then you get off up there in Allentown. And then I would drive home, take me another 40 minutes driving home. Right. Jesus. So, um, but the bus primarily. Yeah. yeah we yeah. take the bus because you could sleep on the bus. Back then, a bus ticket was twenty five bucks round the trip. Yeah, okay. You know, not I mean? a bad deal. Then. Not a bad deal. Yeah, and yeah. you were going up what three nights a week? Two nights a week, and then um, Saturdays. Yeah. yeah, you know, Saturdays were a good day. Um, That's a long session. Saturday, Saturday be all day. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Typically, like a Tuesday, Thursday during the day. Yeah, uh, or a Friday, um, and then. Um, Saturday. And then a Saturday. Yes. And then did you meet Coach Greg up there as well? No, I met Greg here. Same friend. Oh, no shit. Yeah. So, so he was before the academy. Yeah, that guy was a purple belt with um with Enzo. And then eventually he got his black belt. Yeah. I think a lot of people know that. So yeah. a lot of people, I, I assume that you guys met at Enzo's in New York, but you yeah. knew him before then. Mm -hmm. So you guys were at Sambo together. And all no, no, uh, no, not Sambo. He, uh, Greg's from the Allentown area, but he was friends with uh, the, 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 the guy who, um, was training with Hendo originally Oh, no. and Greg was training with him. And then I became friends and then me and Greg started training together and that's how that happened. Wow. Yeah. yeah and then, then, yeah. Then when we opened up our Academy, he, he just came just, down with yeah, us and yeah. everybody was down at our place. He's just a natural transition. So, yeah. okay. Let's talk about that then. So you were, tra you're training, your you're training like hell up in New York. And then eventually you get the blessing from Henzo to open an academy mm -hmm. here. So what was the process like of getting Henzo's blessing? And then also what was the process like of, of starting an academy here and essentially a whole business? So prior to that, we had um, a traditional martial arts school. So okay. we had we had already had taught Shotokan there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you already and had that. was that a in... pretty busy school. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Gene Dunn, another black belt with Henzo, was also, um, I think he was through the JKA organization, uh, okay. Japanese Karate Association. Yeah. Um, but he also um, ran a Shotokan school and then taught jujitsu 
um, in different classes. That's kind of what we did. We okay. had we had the Shotokan classes, and then we would have. But you, it was prim- it was primarily a Shotokan academy with some jujitsu classes in there. Yep, okay. yep, separate. Everything was separate. Yeah. Um. Eventually, that, that and, and then and yeah, and then yeah. how how long till that flipped? Because it was a, like how many how many years would you say were you primarily like when you started introducing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? How many years would you say did it take before Jiu Jitsu? Because Jiu Jitsu is the main focus. It started to pick up, but not near the Shotokan classes. Think about them; they would be 40, 50 people. Oh, you'd wow. have you'd have ten people in a Jiu Jitsu class. Oh, I see. You okay. know, so yeah, it took off, but not like what you're thinking. Okay, I know you yeah, like you the numbers of a Jiu Jitsu class didn't surpass the numbers of a Shotokan no. class so, until a few years later. So yeah, okay. and much later. In fact. Um, we had started offering um, boxing classes and yeah. then Muay Thai classes. So Eric Uch mm-hmm. actually had started my my uh, Muay Thai kickboxing program. Yeah. And everybody knew Eric was sponsored by Fairtex, but I knew yeah. Eric when Eric was starting out. Eric had also trained up in Henzo's, Blue Belt and Jiu-Jitsu. Great, great, guy, great, guy, great guy. Great guy. Great guy. I mean, you know, crazy tough athletic Dude, guy head, head like a lot oh yeah, yeah yeah so i mean him both had boxed out of the same gym up at larry's okay and larry, then, larry, you're saying larry holmes and yeah, yeah yeah yep, yep, larry okay. holmes and Ethan. and then um he uh gotten picked up by he was with uh koban also up in new york he had trained with him and then fairtex had picked him up and he trained with jung sung out and out at fairtex but he had started the program there and then we built off of that I had also started a boxing program. They started to take off a little bit. I would probably say around 2005, 2006 is when you start to see more people coming in for jujitsu, Muay Thai, boxing than you did Shotokan. Okay. I think that's when they started the Ultimate Fighter too, right around the same time. I was going to say that was the transition of martial arts in general where – I mean, you know, I'm I'm not trying to be a jerk, and I have no opinion really on the karate aspect. But karate gets a bad name when it comes to like the Miss Martial Arts game, where it's like it just gets shit on because it was oversaturated with the Tiger Showmans and all these, you know, movies and the karate. It became like almost and a look gimmick. At the Tiger Showmans changed, right? Yeah, they're not what they were. No. They've changed. Um, I think what happened was, and you're kind of, and this is what scares me with jujitsu. Yeah, you're finding you're finding people. That quickly will change what they were doing to something that's favorable for the time Mm -hmm. because it becomes a money thing. Yeah. So you're finding people that really should not be teaching jujitsu, advertising jujitsu or doing anything with it. Yeah. um, And putting jujitsu outside. Yeah. And then when you talk to them, they're like, oh, I teach Japanese jujitsu or I teach American jujitsu. It's like, oh, my God, not this again. The same thing's starting to happen. So there's always those people, the used car salesmen of the martial arts world. And what they do is they start to give jujitsu a bad name, just like it happened with traditional martial arts. Correct. Obviously, um, you know, things had evolved in martial arts and it took some time. But things that evolved and people were now more aware of it. They just figured, oh, they're only seeing MMA. You know, that's not, I don't want to really go and beat somebody up. They weren't looking at jujitsu itself. They were looking at MMA and, oh, it's a, it's a fighting sport. Yeah. All that kind of started to change as people became more educated, became more mainstream. So I would say from Ultimate Fighter was like 2005, I think, right? Spike yeah. TV. Yeah. That kind of catapulted it. Yeah. People started cross training more. You still far- started to see more of the kickboxing and the boxing end of it became more popular. Jiu Jitsu was still there, but not as a, it wasn't as common as it's today. Now I think um, Jiu Jitsu has replaced the traditional Shotokan, Shotokan Taekwondo mm-hmm. type because people are educated now and they realize no, it's a self defense art. It's probably the best self defense art. Agreed. Um, it's a great equalizer. And you're starting to see some of the traditional martial arts and the people who are deserving of teaching those arts come back. The problem is it was these guys that were used car salesmen that yeah. put Shotokan or Taekwondo on their storefront that probably shouldn't have been teaching. They were horrible. Yeah. Uh, you know, they have huge bellies on them yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. out of shape. Yeah. And and there's no reason you can look at them and tell. Like, I mean, if they said that they were a professional fast food eater, then I would say, yes, yeah, that's yeah. you. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, a beer drinker. Yeah. yeah. yeah but they yeah. go, this guy is five, six, and he's 350 pounds. Well, Taekwondo requires a little bit of agility and just by your looks. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm not seeing that. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. I'm not there to be a rocket scientist to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. So unfortunately, they gave people a bad taste of of um, these traditional martial arts. When you look at somebody like Machida, I think he kind of brought it back. If you follow Bellator and you look at a lot of those athletes there, um, a lot of them come from those traditional yeah. um, martial arts. You look at Wonder Boy Thompson, yeah. that same True. movement, it, it is effective. True. If applied correctly with True. the right instruction yes. and you start adding good kickboxing to it and good wrestling and good jujitsu, very effective. Very, yeah. um, and that's proven. Like I said, Wonder Boy Thompson, Machida, and then you look at some of the guys in Bellator. Uh, have a lot of that Eastern European traditional martial arts with jujitsu and wrestling, very effective. Mm. So I just think it was bad instruction. Um, and that's why you find a lot of humor like master Ken, he makes fun of a lot of that yeah. because back in the, in the sixties and seventies, when that was popular, you also had a lot of these guys hijack it, yeah. say they were something they weren't. Yeah. Smoke screen and mirrors. That's the same guy saying he was a Navy SEAL and he wasn't. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Oh, yeah. Um, and, and that that's that's what happened. You're starting to see it in jujitsu. Mm -hmm. People go, Oh, you know, I've had it where people go, Oh, I, I don't want to do jujitsu. I I tried it at this place and I didn't like it. And I go, Who was it? And I go, there's no more smoke screen. And mirror. I have no idea who this person is. You're telling me. And they're like, Yeah, I got it hurt. It wasn't. You know, they put me in the train live the first class, uh, I mean, the very first class woman. So I've heard this over and over again. I said, this is what, when something goes mainstream mm -hmm. and you start to see it become popular and it's proven, it's effective. But now you've get these people who hijack it, who shouldn't be teaching it, yes. teaching it. Yes. And now someone goes and has a bad experience. That's with them the rest of their life. Yes. Very rarely will they go to a legit school then and actually try at a legit place because they're so gun shy. They either got hurt or yeah. deterred um, or the people that were, it was just horrible and they just yeah. had a bad experience. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of, we're hoping that that kind of, you know, yeah. the community, the jujitsu yeah. community sticks together. I think with social media and all that, you can kind of cut those people off I before agree. it gets started. But yeah. years ago, you couldn't yeah. even back in 2005 smoke screen and mirrors. These guys had resumes, resumes. I mean, uh. they, they look like a Bible. How many resumes have you seen? Oh, yeah, they're uh, training 20 different more, more sorts. It yeah. looked like a damn Chinese buffet. <laughs> you know what I mean? I would have them. How about a car come in and give me their resume to come in and train? Jesus. Why do you even want to be here? You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a sushi chef at that point. You know what I mean? Yeah. I love it too when like when someone has the balls to come in and say like I've never done anything I'm like perfect even yeah. better we don't have you don't have to unlearn the dumb shit that they taught you you know I love it when they come in and they're honest like that you do get those people though because they're intimidated right they're intimidated coming in here thinking like well you know I got to be somewhat got to have some alpha in me and say I yeah. did this and it's like bro it doesn't matter yeah. everyone comes in here with a clean slate and you learn the right way but I would say you're exactly right where it's I think the brand name matters when it comes to this. Yeah. And like you're saying, there are, there are instances and we don't have to get into it where it's like people try to take the brand and, and stuff like that. And that's, I think, I think the community itself does a good job of cracking down on that. And like people talk and say like, that's bullshit. Don't know. And like, I think like, I remember people would ask me when they wanted to get into jujitsu, what to look for. I was like, first thing better be goddamn clean. If you go into a place and it ain't clean, walk out, yep. right? You have to look at the facilities, but also if they have like, I called it like a first blood kind of thing or, or fresh meat where it's like you go in and you got to get thrown in the shark tank, get the fuck out of there. Yeah. Because that shit ain't happening. No, those days are gone. And yeah. I think a, a good place, you don't need that. You go, no. I, you know, there's enough out there. You can research the school, yep. the instructor who runs the school, where he came from. Yes. And I go better yet, the people that are there mm -hmm. and are learning. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you can look at white and blue belts, mm -hmm. been there, you know, six months to three years and go, wow, they're good. That's a good place. And Safe, that's going to give you a clean. good, you don't have to look at all the higher, because you could have a nominal yeah. higher rank. That doesn't guarantee that you're doing it right. These people could be athletically gifted too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and could be good that way. But I go, when you look and you see range of ages, sexes, Yes. And everybody's got a solid foundation, yes. you know, and they're good all the way around. That's probably a good place for you. So a little bit of research, go in yourself. He has all his, all his black belts on his website. You know, the shrug has up. Oh, you can't so if you, oh, I didn't know that. So 
So if you're researching a, an academy and the guy's claiming to be a Henzo Gracie black belt, yeah, you're right you on can screen. go on Henzo's website yeah. and be like, well, this guy's full of shit and this guy's full of shit. Wow, that's that's incredible because yeah. that adds real value, like real value to that. Yes. Now that makes a big difference. And everybody that has an academy came up through him at the New York Academy. Has his blessing. Yeah. Has the family blessing. Yeah. You you're not doing it any other way. Yeah. And it should not be. Uh, let's keep talking about this. So, like we said, you when did you open the gym? Ninety seven. Hendrick Gracie PA one I did. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The Hendrick Gracie PA Academy opened in ninety seven. Ninety seven. Uh, no. Uh, we opened. It. We had the gym in ninety seven. We officially opened in ninety nine under Hendrick Gracie PA. Okay. So Hendrick Gracie PA in ninety nine. That. So we're looking at twenty four years. Yeah. That is incredible. Think yeah. about like I. I. You know. I wish like I mean this the trends that have taken place and because fitness is so fashionable where it's like there's a new trend every week like i mean 99 everyone's pounding creatine and doing and doing bench that's press why i said and, i started you know? out i started out in the bodybuilding <laughs> yeah, fitness end yeah. of it. um i was still doing martial arts but kind of was going that way yeah. um i was you know, doing was some huge. fitness sports modeling she did it too yeah um for for athletic wear yeah um and you know then martial arts really started to take place so mid 90s i was looking at more because at that point like ufc i think 93 or yeah, 93 might have been the first ufc mm -hmm. but it really didn't take place until like 94 95 where you started yeah. to see it take off a little bit but the fitness world was real big bodybuilding, fitness modeling, fitness competitions. A lot of that was big then. Yeah. And um, so I was kind of going down that road a little bit yeah. too. Yeah. Then I just got to a point where it was like a crossroad yeah. where martial arts in general started to really blossom because of the USC. Yes. And I kind of had to make a decision like because your time, you know yeah, what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. You made the uh, right between one. <laughs> between, you know, the fitness world and bodybuilding versus it's such different type of training. Yes. And, you know, for a while I try, I did both, but it was very difficult, oh, you know, I can't imagine. Um, but then, and then at a certain point you got to change the way you train. It's geared different towards a sport than it is for, you know, modeling what? and posing and stuff like that. That makes so much sense because well, I started here in 07. And even back then, the nutritional aspect of fitness and in fighting was non-existent. No. Like I was still running in, in plastic suits and, yep. and not eating and not drinking and, yep. and like starving yourself to the point of like muscle atrophy. Like we, we were doing all that still, yep. you know, because yep. yep. that's just because like we came up through wrestling. That's all we knew. But you were always big in new, like you had a hand in nutrition because remember we yep. would bring in what was eight weeks out. Yep, we had that stuff you brought in, yep. and you were like, I did all that. The eight weeks out, yeah. So like, but you guys were both real keen on the nutritional aspect yep. side, which was way ahead of the game. Yep. Be yep. With Jocelyn, yeah. So yeah, we worked on that. Worked on that end of it um, to Be create a product that well, could use for people that were competing in sports. Yes, and you, but like. You got the nutritional side from the bodybuilding, would you say? Because that, like, yes. nutrition, that's been day one with yes. bodybuilding. A lot of, and right? a lot of the weight cutting end of it more so. And you start to see a lot of the weight cutting end um, in the mixed martial arts end of it coming back Big now. time. Um, you know, there is some do's and don'ts, but that that part of it and the, and the process, you're seeing that yeah. come back. Um, and that was more correct than the trash bag Duh. and running in the steam shower or the sauna Forget with wrestling. That, so that, you have nightmares about that. You know, shit, the bodybuilding you know? world was very good on that end of it. And the fitness world, as far as cutting weight yeah. and, and um, proper nutrition, that is, that was always a strong suit. And you have end. the the best saying, and you said it on Sydney's episode too, you can't outwork a bad diet. Yep. You can't outwork a bad diet. And that's the damn truth. Yep. Yep. So, okay. When you first started the gym, what did you like, 
with because you like you said Shotokan was kind of the main not maybe not the main focus but that was where most of the the class people were coming in and jujitsu and then you also had boxing and muay thai which is really yep. have still been in they were still in the moment. infant stages also yeah um because you didn't have group boxing back then mm -hmm. that was something that we created there was nothing there was yeah. no la boxing yeah was before any of that yeah and i remember talking to keith johnson who was one of larry's trainers up there and yeah. we might he's like rich i don't think you could do it on a scale i said yeah but you know something here's the difference keith you never trained in traditional martial arts mm. i think boxing you could teach like you do a traditional martial art That's think about it it's the same thing it's, yeah it's the warm-ups yep right and then it's the, it's 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 the um the repeat yeah right traditional martial arts you always go through the the basic fa the fundamentals right yes. so you do your warm-ups then you have your fundamentals you go through so you're repeating that and then technique mm -hmm. you can do that with boxing the same mm -hmm. i actually started the boxing the boxing the, the see the boxing. that honestly now that you mention it you are 100 percent right because when i was a kid there was no class you could no. go to you could have a trainer and you could go there, and then there were sparring sessions and all that nonsense. So but if we're doing show to come like this, why can't we have the boxing? Yeah, you're exactly. And then you built it like you had the like at, even at the old place, you had the heavy bags yep. around. It, you it, know, it was set up for group training, but like a martial art. Yeah, if you look at jujitsu, it's taught like a lot of your traditional martial arts now. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Over the years, it's actually gotten better. You can see um, you yeah. The boxing when we first started the boxing yeah there's a uh the, if you want for all those listening there'll be a link to the hens or gracie pa youtube page in the description of this episode highly suggest checking out and subscribing yeah, yeah they uh they actually i was going through it the other day there's an old video of me and harry doing yeah, this yep. oh my god so, <laughs> 11 years ago or a something lot of people don't oh, realize nice. it. Very so, good. a lot of people don't realize when you went to a boxing gym down the city yeah it basically had old cruddy equipment that the Y threw out, they took on, was, there would be one or two heavy bags. Yep. Um, and basically it was just, it, it was like a boys club. Yeah. It, you went there to just get off the streets, get a little workout. The yeah. trainers you had to pay for. Yeah. So there was no free trainers. Maybe if you were a young athletic kid and you were you. like eight, nine years old, if you were like 16 or 17, never boxed, the trainers wouldn't even pay attention to you. No. They wanted the young kid that they can mold. They might take you on as a freebie and, and a project. But for typically uh, one of the parents, they had to pay one of the trainers. It might be ten or fifteen dollars a session, mm -hmm. um, you know, to get a a boxing lesson. But that was no guarantee because you were going to like say Frazier's, that little gym he had. Yeah. You had to pay for a trainer. You had to you paid a membership like thirty bucks to belong there. Go there. You could jump rope. You can hit the bag. But, if but no wanted, one's instructing you. Nobody's, nobody's instructing, instructing you. you. Yeah. So we took it. And like I said, it was before LA boxing or any of that. And looked at it like a martial art, broke yeah. it down like a martial art, and then taught it the same way. Yeah. Why not? They do it with kickboxing. Yeah. You know, Dutch Genius. kickboxing, Thai boxing. Changed the, it, honestly, it changed the game. It opened it up to where, like, the class, there's so many different exercises and fundamental exercises you can do as a group and make sure everyone gets the same. Here's the treatment. problem with that, though. Other people got the idea in the fitness world. Oh. So you got, I was go. there's difference between a coach Bruh. and a push holder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have guys that hold mitts that have no idea about boxing or no. kickboxing or anything, but they're actually good mitt holders. Yeah. But they have no idea. I would never go with them and then decide to take a fight <laughs> because they have no idea. It's fitness based. Yeah. It's meant to make you tired, sure, burn sure. calories. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's have all they're doing. Have you seen some of the, like, oh, they're holding bad. mitts, but it's like, the, the punching is bad. Oh, like, it's, it's, it's bad. And everything's bad. I'm not trying to be a jerk, but I'm, not, I'm looking at them like, yeah. They're not looking to correct you to cheat. No, you. no. That takes time. They're just getting work. They want to keep you moving from A to B. So I was just, I always say to people, again, as boxing became more popular, you also have people that hijacked it who are not boxing trainers, have True. no background. True. You do some research, you can find out they have no idea. They couldn't. They couldn't wrap a set of hands. No. Uh, it, you know, they wouldn't tell you the proper equipment to get. No. They couldn't do nothing. Even their pad work, if you're just doing basic stuff in front, how many of them you see they jump in and out? Yeah. The footwork's a mess, and that's yeah. where you start. You're Somebody that knows boxing, understands boxing, it, it, it starts with the feet, yeah. and it works its way up. Yeah. Uh, Remember he's a big, tall, and thing with Sam? Sam. Remember the one dude, he was, like, jacked out yeah. of his mind? Really, really great guy. 
you did it with the boxing and um I bet at the old place you help us start the boxing for your Right. Oh, you're talking about Sammy from Larry's. Yes. Sammy from Larry Holmes's okay. gym. I can't think of he, Sammy. Sammy was Iranian. Okay. I can't, you know who knows him real well? Grady. Yes. Yes. Grady knew him really well. Super nice guy. I was just asking him because he was friends with Frankie. Yes. So Evan, Evan knows Frankie. And I asked, I asked, I told him, I said, ask about uh, Sammy. I haven't seen him for years. No, he was great. He would come down. So Sammy from, from Larry, from Larry yeah, Holmes's yeah. gym would come down and he kind of got the boxing program. He would help out. He would help out with the kids. Like, okay. uh, like Devin McMasters. He would, oh, work some of the young kids. he would help me out. I mean, it's been, it's been years. Great guys though. But that was, that was the infant stage of the boxing program. The boxing program is still going. Yeah. Still going strong, yep, yep. So. But that's what happened. It got hijacked and yeah. you said, just like traditional more charts. People, they the they, 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 they throw a label on there, and then yeah. everyone goes, "Oh, I, I just I box at this place, or I box this place." Especially women, I always get them on the phone. It's always the same. Oh, I boxed already. <laughs> when they come in, they've got cardio gloves. Yeah, the yeah. crappiest wraps you could get. I'm yeah. like, you hit them one of my 150 pound bags, you're gonna break your little hands. Yeah, yeah and then yeah. you watch them. They're like on their toes, and they're like powder puff in the bag. Yeah, it's like okay, you you did a cardio boxing class is yeah. what you did. Yeah. And there's a difference. And I have to explain to people, everything we teach is instructional. The kickboxing is instructional. The boxing's instructional. The jujitsu is instructional. Um, there's no cardio version of any of that. And that sometimes I you but like, you get the it. cardio doing it. Like yeah. when you do it right, you still get you, the workouts even better. People better. tried faking it with jujitsu, but they get exposed, right? Big time. But, on the kickboxing and boxing end of it, they can kind of fake a little bit of that. Yeah. So they're not really training live with anybody. Yeah. So it's harder to get exposed. Yeah, if you got in the ring. If, if you got you in the ring for real, yeah, then yeah. you go, okay, especially some of the younger guys. But it's one of those yeah. those flags they can hide behind. Yeah, yeah. And that's what happens with those two. And I tell everybody, do a little research. Yeah. You know, because what if you learn the wrong way, like these women that come through and it's usually with women and trainers take them on. They went from personal training and then they have a little check mark next to them. Oh, I also do boxing. Yeah, you know, And yeah. they start with them. They end up with all these bad habits. And now you're just trying just to a, correct yeah. them. The whole thing them. is, yeah. It Before takes, you can even get the real thing going, you have to undo all the you have to undo all the. And sometimes that's more difficult. That's why I said, do some research. You're going to do jujitsu. Go to a real school, do yeah. some research, learn yeah. it correctly the first time, yeah. and you're going to have a solid, it's a life skill. Yeah. All of those martial arts are life skills. Big time. Learn it. It takes more time, but in the end, you're going to be better off. You have a life skill. You can go anywhere in this world. It's a yeah. universal language. Yeah. Any of these. Yeah. You know? I agree. I agree. And, you know, we were, so talking about owning the gym, and you're absolutely right. When I tell people to come in here, like, I'm I'm like, this ain't a quick fix. This is a life changing thing. Like you have to commit and it's not like you have to commit your whole life to this, but if you commit to this place, the, the revenue you get out of there is unbelievable. But so I want to ask you a couple questions. So what would you say? I mean, you've been here 24 years. What would you say when people come in is the number one reason why most people join the gym? Number one reason is something happened in their life. That made them go, oh shit, yeah. I got to learn to protect myself or yeah. I got to get in really good shape. Yeah. It's one of those two things, if not both. It's happened with law enforcement, mm -hmm. been in a situation yeah. and literally they, they got out of it by the skin of their teeth, yeah. but it scared them enough. Shit, I got to learn how to defend myself. I'm limited on time. Mm -hmm. Or the other thing, people are so out of shape, like COVID scared people that were out of shape enough to where they went. Yeah. Oh shit. I ever get that. I got to get myself. So they want to take care of themselves. They don't like lifting weights. Yeah. They don't like doing running on a treadmill. They want, they got to find something. So group training itself is always going to keep you more engaged. Mm -hmm. You find people, common interests, you have common likes. Um, you meet a couple times a week at a place and you're both, I mean, you know what it's like when you get done. Yeah. You've got, you know, you're on that high after doing jujitsu. You know oh, yeah. what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like it's 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 fun. And when you do it with people that you like, it even makes it even more fun. Yes. And that before you know it, time flies, that engages you. So that's the main reason. Something happened that that put them on the I, the alert list where they went, oh shit. Yeah. You know, I know for me. One of the reasons I wanted to find this when I was a younger kid, 
I was like, you know, pretty rebellious and got in the fights. I and heard stuff. stories. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm saying even as like a young, young kid, like, you know, like a five, six years old, like, you know, fighting in school, but like, <laughs> yeah, you know, but just having fun. But then eventually, like, you know, oh, God, it would like it would eventually get like, you know, beaten out of me, so to speak, where it's like you know like after all the years of like like certain things happening that i was afraid of someone just going for a high five i would flinch you know yeah. what i mean and you get in that mindset but then i knew it to myself i was like i'm not this person and you need uh, and honestly that's one of the things that attracted me here is that i wanted to get that person back you know and it was I had already started trying to, but I wasn't going down the right way of doing it. And like, I had gone to a bunch of gyms in the city and like we earned stripes there, but it wasn't the same. And, you know, when I found this place, that's where you find like a real home and a real path. And like that, that, that's, that's one of the things I think is really special about this place. But would you say like, I don't know when, I don't know when people come here with a story like that and with, you know, they're looking for protection. Honestly, I can kind of see it, especially when it's like a younger kid who I'm like, this kid probably got bullied at school. They don't, they don't tell you in the beginning. You find out later on down the road, but I know. Yeah. I know. When they fill out that paperwork. Yeah. I know. I've never had anybody put, Oh, I want to be a world champion. (laughs) Oh, I can't wait to compete. Yeah. I never had any of that. No, you know, they might, they might, they might say some of the more athletic people that come in or they're really good at sport. Those people will say, Hey, uh, how long do you, where I fight? You know, what do you think? Those people never last. They never last. No, they're all full of shit. It's the ones that come in quiet, you know, from a young kid to an adult, young kids. It's usually, they're usually bullied. Yeah. They're introverted. Yeah. Um, they don't feel comfortable yeah. in group settings or or some of these group sports because you have the niches. You know what I mean? You yeah. have the really good kids that are put on a pedestal. You have the kids that aren't. You know, I always say to everybody, look, if it was really fair, could you take the really athletic kids and say maybe they're not your scholar students and put them in the gifted classes? No, the gifted people would have a freaking fit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But – you can't take kids that aren't that athletic and expect them to start with it yeah. and a starting it, but they do have intramural stuff. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that there is something for these kids, Correct. but martial arts is the best fit for them, yes. especially doing jujitsu. You know, I think that it gets them in a setting where this is, you're in a group class. A lot of times people that are there have gone through the same thing. Um, you're learning skills to defend yourself. You're learning life skills. Physically, it makes you better at everything. Mm-hmm. You know, it gets you strong, flexible, good, solid mindset. And I feel like that person um, can overcome a lot after doing jujitsu versus any other sport. And yeah. that's the fit for them. I agree. Um, and even as an adult, the same thing. Yeah. Um, you know, the adults just are better communicators. So they'll tell you. Yeah, no, this scared me. This yeah. happened to me. This is why yeah. I'm coming in and, and training. Yeah. Uh, you're seeing it a lot with women now. Yes. They have had close calls. Um, I get it. I, 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 You know, this this happened a couple of years ago, but I had a guy come back to me and say, hey, thank God my daughter trained when she was younger. This happened her freshman year in college. She got sure. a, got attacked coming, Boy, out, of, yeah. party, coming yeah. out of a party, yeah. kid drinking, got too aggressive, and uh, tried to attack on her. And she ended up guillotining him <laughs> and he drove her to the ground. Yeah. Like thinking he was just going to boom. And she just closed that guard, guillotined him, put him out and Let being them... drunk. Oh yeah. And he urinated himself. <laughs> so he was humiliated that yeah. way. Yeah. Then he just got his ass kicked by a girl. And no one's and ever going to mess with this girl. No. And no one's going to ever mess with this girl. She was a little girl. And the thing is you have a lot of, I find it big in the, uh, the soccer community and nothing against soccer. I love soccer. Right. But, Oh, seven days a week. They want your kid, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I've never had somebody come back to me and say soccer ever saved their life. No. Ever. No. Ever. Yeah. I've had people come back and say, thank God yeah. my kid trained two or three times a week at your yeah. place. Yeah. Because it saved her ass. And yeah. even with the young boys, it saved them. And and you hear these stories. They're just not out in the public. Yeah. But you hear them more than not. You could be the best soccer player in the world. You get in a situation, you have no training. So I always go, you have to you have to split that training up. For, for you to... Put three or four hours a week to the side to do um, a, a a good martial arts like jujitsu and learn how to protect yourself. You have plenty of time to be good at soccer, football, yes. baseball, yes. and all these other things. Yes, but you need to 
And you, you don't even need to put to self-defense in priority. Yeah. And you don't even have to ever compete. No. You just have to know. You have to have, they're, they're life skills. Yeah, exactly. It's a life skill. I, yeah. gonna make, and plus, it's going to make you a better, it's going to make you a better soccer player. It's going to make you a better football player. Oh. Um, it, it improves all that. Even it makes you better at doing your homework. It makes you better at doing your chores. Just because mentally you're so much stronger than you'll ever be. And focus. I couldn't agree more. I'll tell you, I told my wife, I was like, it's a non-starter. I'm going to give it, like, I'll, I'll, if I have to drag her here, she's coming. You find it. You got to get the girls started young. You, you got to, you got to get the girls, you got to get the girls started young because once you get into the teenage years, say 12, 13, it becomes awkward. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, young, yeah, yeah. If they're young, it's not. Yeah. It's, it's normal. It's yeah. the natural thing. Once they start getting into the teenage years, yeah, it can be they awkward. can't be rolling around with so, boys. So yeah. I just say, I say, and there's some that it doesn't matter, but right. I, 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 I always, I always go get them started young and it's going to be a normal thing for girls do. They're not going to look at it any differently and they're going to have fun. And it's the best martial art. Yes. If they want to defend themselves. This is going to be the yes. best martial art. Yes. Or none. Size doesn't matter. It's Size a great matter. equalizer. hundred percent. So I, I feel that a lot. You're starting to see it with American European. Asian countries tend to take that stuff yeah. more serious, faster. Over here. You're just starting to see it where people are going, okay, I don't just have to fight. I can do this. Get in shape, learn how to defend myself. Yeah. My kids come in, they're yeah. learning how to defend myself. And that's why the program is set up like that. Kids and then adults. Did you know this too? That in PA, there is now a PIAA state championship for women's wrestling. Yeah. There's yep. enough women's wrestling teams in the yep. state of Pennsylvania that there's a women's wrestling PI yes. state championships. North Penn has a women's team. Yeah. Right. Like they are, it, it, and honestly, think 20 years ago, that would have never been. Ne oh, never. And I'll tell you this. The, and Steve Cabot told me he runs the youth program for North Penn, and they did like a, a youth night where it was they took four youth guys from the, or four youth kids from North Penn went against like four youth kids I think from uh, CB West or something, right? And he said it was three boys and a girl, and all it was on the North Penn team, and they pinned all four of the CB West kids. And he said the girl beat the shit out of this yep. kid. And I'll tell I tell him I was like, dude, when you're younger. Girls, they're like a nine-year-old girl versus nine-year-old boy. A nine-year-old oh, yeah. girl is gonna whoop that kid's ass oh, yeah. every damn time. I, I tell they the parents, are vicious. I, I tell the parents, like until they start to get into the teenage years, um, your boy's gonna have a tough time with the girls. Yeah, it's just the way it is. It is. Um, and they're, they, and they're they, smarter, they're stronger. Oh, they're they got, and they, and they oh. have a they have a switch. Oh, oh yeah. So um, they're oh they're I'll tell you they are cutthroat. There okay. is no like okay. once that goes that goes so perfect and then. Another question you must get, right? And, you know, I think people see, like, especially if you go to, like, the LA fitnesses of the world, they're looking for quick fixes and things like mm -hmm. that, right? Do people come in here and ask you, like, hey, how do I do get better at this quicker? Because I'll tell you this. Like, when I have a kid come to me and say, I want to fight, right? Like, I want to have a fight. I was like, okay, come to every class, and then we can talk, right? Like, yep. start coming to every class, and we can talk. Once you do that, then we can, you know, once you've, you need to go to every class, to then graduate to the point where you're you need more than the class, then that's when we'll do personal training. Then I'll put you in camp. Then we can have yep, a fight, yep. right? What? But like, what? When people come to you, ask how to do, be better quicker. What do you tell them? Just train as much as you can yep. and be consistent. Oh. I'm going to give you direction. I'm going to give you advice. I know you're not going to take it, <laughs> but I'm going to give it to you anyway. <laughs> if you listen to me, yeah, you'll be fine. Ones that did. Dental Bill. Oh. Forbatum. He listened to me. Sydney Outlaw. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Show up, train. What's the difference with them? They listened. They went to all the classes. They never thought they were above the class. I get a lot of people, oh, I want to do private lessons. They almost feel like when you get people that are doing a lot of private lessons, they almost are taking themselves out of the group, putting themselves here and going, eh, they might do one class once in a while, but they're doing Mostly private lessons. Yeah. The private lesson is either if you're competing to get you sharpened up for a competition, that's why you would do those lessons. Or if you're a new person and you're kind of stuck. And then the other person is the person who travels for work. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can't make all the classes, but they want to keep up with everything. That's what it's for. Mm -hmm. It's not worth, it's not for a person who lives 10 minutes from the gym and they just don't want to be in the class because yeah. they don't want all the people to deal with. Yeah. Um. That's, they're training partners. They're going to actually make you better. The different size people to train with, the different body types, that's what's going to make you better. So come in, be consistent, train as often as you can. Yeah. 
different, try and have different training partners um, and, and consistency. And that's going to help. Consistency is king. Can, 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 yeah, that's going to make the difference. Um, I always tell people you can only be the new person for so long. Yes. If you're a guy that comes in and you train once a week or once every other week as need be, and you're never here and you start with a certain group of people, there. you're going to go 30 days down the road. You're going to have less people that are going to want to partner up with you. Yep. 60 days, 90 days down the road. And they're going to freaking go. There's no way. I don't want this guy with me. He's yeah. lost. He has no idea what he's doing. He's a slug. He's so yeah. in. And then that guy goes, oh, I've been here three months. I don't want to be with the new people. Mm -hmm. He feels like he's beyond them because his group has moved on. Yeah. And then you go six months down the road. He goes to train with them. The people that he started with, he's thinking, I oh, should be we, equal yeah, with yeah, them. Yeah. And, and they're, they're kicking his ass. Yeah, and they're ragged going, I don't get it. Buddy, you show up once a week. Yo, I always I always say you that. You preach that. And honestly... I freaking hate when I like I don't do that, and every time I'm like, "Fuck, what was the second move that they?" Show? You know yep. what I mean? You know, like even, but I didn't. I do like that. I mean, I I video some of them, so yeah. I can, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can look at the videos, but but consistency, which, yeah, consistency, having an open mind, and um, you know, getting out there. That's kind of why I have different instructors too, yeah, because people sometimes maybe the way I'm conveying it, you're just not getting, it, and all of a sudden someone else just yeah, words are a little different, yeah, it sticks. You know, um, plus two, I think, and I've, and I told you about this and I experienced this where one of the best things you preach about being here is that if you're a veteran here or someone who's been here for a while, it is your goddamn job to help with the new people. We don't teach like this shit, like, yeah, you we're giving you a life skill, but part of being part of this is you need to pass on that information. Right. Like I remember I, I ripped the, the Muay Thai guys, a new one on Thursday, because Josh was helping the kids. I had just come in and they're doing their sparring rounds and like the round had ended and they're all standing around. And after, and I was like, all right, let's go next round. Like, and I yelled at him and I was like, Hey, dipshits. Like you've all been here long enough. You know, someone, you know how this works, get your shit together. You know what the next round is, you know, to switch partners. We shouldn't have to tell you this. You know what I mean? Like for the veteran guys, you guys should have stepped up and taken the lead. Yep. This is bullshit, you know? And they kind of got the message there, but on the Moita or on the jujitsu side, like, I don't know how many people have come up to me like, or I love to like, if I get tapped in a, in a role, right. Like right after we're done the role, they'll talk and be like, look, you were doing this. And that's why I was able to do this. Or you did this. That's what, and yeah. that's all you need. They and then getting better. Exactly. Your training part, your, your Karen, your favorite saying, your training partners are your tools, right? You don't want to break your tools. You know what I mean? You just want to sharpen them. Yep. I make you better. You're going to make me better. Couldn't agree more. And that's how it gets passed on. You yeah. get to people, they get to a certain level. And they start separating themselves from the group. Yeah. Ridiculous. And yeah. then when they start separating them from the group, yeah, you know, it, it, they're not, they're not, they're not, that's offensive. They're not, they're not giving back. Like the purple belt, uh, and they, yeah, they're just like, uh, you know, but they could work with them. They could exactly and help them out. They, you and can then, still, if you have five rules, do four with the upper belts and one with the lower belt. And break. then you need the break ground anyway to just go over yeah. and, and hey, look, when I tell a guy when, you know, like, the, you know, the, you know, on the boxing Muay Thai side, there's no like, you know, a beaten on an out skilled guy. Yeah. Like, you know, if you're in there with a lesser skilled opponent, work on your defense. You shouldn't be touched by a punch. You shouldn't be, yes. you shouldn't be passed or you shouldn't have a thing put on you if you're with a lower guy. Your defense should be impactful. Yeah, the best school students are students, white, brown, black, you name whoever. They're the best students. They're the best ones that put their hand out to help everybody. I couldn't agree they more. The best school yeah. That's, and that's where I always hear that people, people that come in are always like, well, I've been to other places. I mean, everybody's so nice. I'm getting yeah. greeted in the parking lot on my way in. It does yeah. make people feel comfortable. I agree. Because you get through those doors, it's so it's uncomfortable. Intimidating. It's, it's intimidating. intimidating. Yeah. And uh, people go, when someone puts their hand out to introduce themselves yeah. before you even walk through the yes. place, it definitely makes you feel more comfortable. And they're saying hi. You yes. know, I couldn't agree more. I think everyone here, I, you know, Mike Vrabel said this, and he was on the New England Patriots. He has a bunch of Super Bowl rings. And he said the best teams in the NFL are the ones where the veterans are grooming the younger guys to take their jobs. Those are the best teams. That's what this place is. It's not that we're grooming someone to take our job, mm -hmm. but they're grooming them because it just raises the level and of the gym. And I'll tell you, that's a, I don't care who you, who the hell you are. You can be whatever belt. You go in that room when it's a packed night, that's a rough room to go through. Yep. And you're going to run into a bunch of – even like the purples and the blues, there's a bunch of good guys over there that they can give you – even if you're a black belt, they're going to give you a tough time. And we have you a know? group. I mean, we have a good match. Yeah. We have – 
30, 30, 35 to 55 yeah. is the new norm, right? Yeah. Family based. Yeah. White collar professional. Yep. And military. A lot of law enforcement. Um, a lot of law enforcement. A lot of military. That. So that. that being the bulk. Um, and then with that, wrestling. you have a lot of the young kids. Yeah. yeah big wrestling community. Yes. So a lot of that in here. So you kind of know what your base is. And then it spans out from there. Where 20 years ago, it was late 20s, early 30s, young, athletic. And they just wanted to go and 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 compete. Yeah, they yeah, were yeah. looking. That's all. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we had fight when we were having fight camps. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Remember those Sunday sessions? God damn, those Saturday and Sunday sessions. Grown men crying. God damn, those. All right. Those... Ryan Darstein walks in. <laughs> I was so sure. It was seven days in a row. I walked in, and I was going to start crying, and I looked around and. Nobody else was crying, so I didn't want to. I didn't want to be the only one. Now that's Ryan. Yeah, you know I mean? but, dude, I'll tell you when you said get to the stairwell at the old place, I was like, God damn, not this. I, I told everybody everything you guys are doing is nothing I did, and I had yeah. people that are back me. Yeah, I did. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. All no, of it. I think. Uh, I I think that went without saying. Everyone, they're like, you wouldn't do anything to us that you hadn't done. Yeah, I went through it, did the same exact yeah. thing. Um, I always said, prepare now, and when you know, because people. You know, you get younger people there now that are having interest in competing. And I go, whether you want to get an interest in doing MMA or or, or boxing or kickboxing, yeah. there's a there, there's a place to start. So be consistent training. Um, you know, obviously you have to up your, you know, your 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 training when you go to compete. Yeah. But you can't, you know, twice a week, three times a week, you're a hobbyist. Yes. Right? You're Correct. a hobbyist. Correct. I would never go and compete. You're there to showcase your skills, not learn new skills when you compete. Yes. So if you're competing, you should be there five, six days a week. Yeah. Compete or for, for, to, to get ready for a competition and not, um, you know, four weeks out. Yeah. Now that should be three months out. You go from three days a week to five or six. Yes. Now, you're going to be ready. You're there to showcase your skills, not learn new skills. Yeah. You know, and um, that way, if you lose, you, 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 yeah. you lost the best version. You know, yeah. you put 110 in, you just have to get more skill and get, yeah. become better. Yeah. It has nothing to do with your conditioning. Yeah. If you lose, Hey, if you lose, if you go on your shield, you go on your shield. That's one thing. Yes. Right. But if you go in there and you lost because you didn't have the conditioning or you didn't have the training, that's on you. Yes. And you, that, and you, and you'll feel that for the rest of your damn look, life. When, and, and this is the big thing when new people come in, even about training, they go, well, if I want to train once a week, why wouldn't you sign me up for once a week? I go, because you're going to be, you're going to be sore more than not. And after two weeks, you're going to fall so far behind it. it you're going to feel like you're not getting anything out of it. Yeah. And, and I'm not going to sign you up for that. You're, you're and same thing with a child. Someone goes, well, they got, they got soccer, the rest. And all I could do is squeeze one day. And well, if that's all you're willing to sacrifice, um, you're, you're not going to get, get it. You're yeah. not, your, your child's not going to get something out of it. They're going to fall behind. Then they're not going to want to do it. Yeah. So why would I, why would I do that? You yeah. two being the, the minimum, the bare minimum mm -hmm. three, ideally. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you're going to get something out of it. You're going to feel good. I go, it's like Your going to school. You show up once a week for school, but yet school's five days a week. Yeah. You're going to fall behind pretty quick. Don't you think? Yeah. Think, wow. I never looked at it. I never, I never looked at it like that. And I go, that's how you have to look at it. Look, once you have a solid foundation and your work or your schedule only allowed you once a week, you already, you got five years under your belt. Yeah. You can pick up the pieces and go, you already got a foundation, mm -hmm. but if you don't have that, then and, 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 you know, you need to train. So we are coming close to the top of time. I do have like two more questions. I just want to ask. So yep. if you had to say, so like we said, it's been 24 years we've been here. So there's a lot of, I would wonder, I would want to know what you would say to this is that what advice would you give to someone who's opening up a gym now? Like, what would you, what was some advice you would give them? Cause I remember a couple of years ago I was bartending still. And so was my brother and someone approached us, Hey, we'd front you if you guys wanted to open up your own place. And I'd, and I remember talking to my, the guy I was working for at the time and I said, hey, someone came to us with this offer. Like, what What would you say? And he told me, he's like, look, if you're going to open up your own spot, just know you're working every day. Every day you work, you know? And he gave us, like, great advice and things like that. But so for someone opening up a gym nowadays, what's some advice that you would give them? 
well, this is the person that wants to do it. Yeah. It's usually the person that shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're wow, not. Wow. That is fucking true. <laughs> you know, you have all these people and you're going, well, it really should be this person. But yeah. It's usually the person that's the lowest on the food chain. Yeah. Oh Maybe got themselves a little bit better. Right, right, right. Uh, Chopped a little wood. Yeah. You know, and they might be the best version of them, but that does not mean that they should be teaching this nor having a school but it's also you're not even it's not as much teaching as you're create you created a community right so if, in my thought if you're if you're if you're gonna have a henzo named gym with henzo's blessing you're not creating a gym you're creating a community you're creating a family and that's a major responsibility so here's the biggest thing okay people go and they won't like what you say to them if you say that to them. Like, yeah. I don't think you're qualified to really do this. That's yeah. besides yeah. every day, think about working. You're living it. Yeah. You're 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 maintaining your place. This is like a you're child. Cleaning. Oh, yeah. Every little problem that comes along, you're dealing with. Yeah. Um, it just never ends. <laughs> yeah. It's good and bad. So just because you like doing jujitsu, it doesn't mean it's like people in the fitness world, they open up a gym. It doesn't mean that that is going to be like that. Yeah. Yes, you have. It has to be. I always tell people, you're going to do it. One, you want to be good at it. Yeah. Two, it's got to be like a passion. There's a difference between a passion and a hobby. Somebody who's passionate will think about it every day. It doesn't matter what's going on in this world. You're training. You trained on New Year's Day. We trained on. You the were day training after Christmas. We, you, you, this place is always open. You, you were training and just kind of going on. It was a sad time. But you just kept going. Let me tell you, the hobbyists that when they they'll think of ways like this, everything has to be perfect for them to train that day. I always tell people they think of more excuses uh, on not to train than on how they can yeah, train. Okay. I remember when I had a broken hand, and she's like, "You can't train." After a week, I got a hacksaw. Remember that? I hacksawed the thing off. And boom! I wrapped it up. Yeah. Yep. And um, threw the cast in the corner. <laughs> She's like, you're nuts. I go, no, I got to train. You f <clears throat> I don't know if that's correct, but you find a way to train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't, More, we don't, we don't condone that. I do not. <laughs> Most yeah. people find a way to come up with excuses. Yes. Oh, I can't. Oh, oh, I, I got this. I this, I this. Oh, I hurt my, I hurt my big toe. Yeah. There's always a reason. They have to look at themselves and go. My yeah. Oh my god, I remember. But. When you're constantly thinking like excuses yeah. on not to train, that might not be the thing for you. So my my advice would be to somebody just because you like doing it yeah. doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the right thing. It's yeah. a long road. The other thing is, if you think you're going to be rich doing it, you might as well forget that. Yeah, You can make a good living for yourself, but you're doing a lot of free. Yeah, uh, I couldn't even tell you. Over the years, and you know this, I've taken on kids that could not afford yeah. that I, I took them. I was one of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I took them under my wing. Yeah. And not just class time, a lot of one on one time. Yeah. I've constantly, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people who are very successful now in this and are very good in this business. And many years I took them under my wing free. Yeah. They did the classes. They were with me, yeah. personal training, um, private lessons, and absorbed everything. Yeah. Um, I made sure they had everything they needed um, to be successful. Um, but, you know, it's not for everybody. Yeah, it yeah. really is not. It's unique. I think yeah. a lot of people realize, oh, I'm good. I feel like I'm pretty good at this when they're really not. And they're like, ah, you know. Well, you said it too. Plus, too, it's a big difference between being good at it and being good at teaching it too. Yes. You know, that's a big difference. Yeah. Look, if you're a, if you're an introverted person and you have to teach with 40, 50 people, that might not be good for you. Yeah. You, and you, you also, you can't go, well, I just don't like talking to people. People come in or they call. You know, you want you have to be able to engage yes. and talk. And sometimes yeah. that's difficult for people. Yeah. I've had people email me and I go, well, I need to call you. I need to, you know, I, I we just don't do walk-ins. Yeah. You have to make an appointment. That way I know who you are. Yes. Coming in my building, you have to provide ID. Mm -hmm. I have people in here I'm responsible for. You just can't just come walking in. Yep. So you need to call me and I'll set you up and I'll make an appointment. And I've had people go, I only go by email. I go, well, this isn't the place for you. I don't like to talk. <laughs> yeah. Well, this isn't the place for you. Then. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to have you come in here. I want to know who you are. Yeah. That you're a person Especially that. Especially too with everything that's happened. Can you kidding me? No. You know, and so, there's kids in here. Yeah. Yeah. We just had that. So it, 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 
people get upset when they go because every now and then I get somebody that does not want to pr- provide ID when they come in the building and they don't want to talk on the phone. There are two no-nos. You'll never come to my academy. Mm-hmm. You have to make an appointment. Um, if you want to take classes and you want me to put some time into you, well, you got to you gotta give back a little bit. Sure. Talk to me. Give me some information on you. And I'll make sure that you have a great experience yeah. coming in. Yeah. And then I always go, once you're a member, you're going to appreciate that. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. you're in a safe, clean environment. We yeah. just we just had somebody that left their wallet here. You know, a couple of weeks ago you, on a Saturday. Your wallet with cash sticking out. And here that's and exactly then, what it was. Yeah. And I ended up finding out whose wallet it was. It was actually um, Jesse Herzl who found it in the bathroom. I called him up. I was here for a couple hours on a Saturday and he came by and all the money was there in the cards. And he goes, any other gym that would have never happened. Never right? in a million and I, years. He goes, it's, it's, it's literally, I always tell everybody, it's like a big it's like a big Ivy League school, but yet it's the hometown college, you yeah, know, the hometown school. Yeah. Um, that's the feel you get. So, um, you know, he got his wall back, all his money. He was so excited. He goes, and that's why I'm here with my family, you know? So, all right. We are coming to the top of time. So before we get out of here, Rich, is there anything you want to say? I want to thank you for being on here. And if you'd be willing, I'd love to have you back. on. Absolutely. We'll do it. it again. I can honestly, I want to get you and, when you were with me in Sydney, that was such a blast. You're a natural co-host, so yeah. if anyone watching, listening, wants to be on the show with me and Rich, hit us up in the comments, or if anyone has any ideas, let us know on socials. We'll have all the links in the description. We could but, just make fun of them. I mean, oh, yeah, we could, we could we, do that. We could rip people to shreds on <laughs> here. The um, <laughs> having, yeah, but, but yeah. no, the story constructive criticism. Right, the stories you're talking about, Sydney, was not like, even all of them. That's that, that, that was that, like that, a, that. when you're sneaking in the burgers and the cookies and. <laughs> The, you didn't even tell the swimming story. <laughs> no, but here he's learning to swim now. Oh. I'll tell him real quick. So okay. He's learning to swim now. Okay. We went to swim many years ago. He was yeah. looking to cut weight. He didn't yeah. want to run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went to go to the pool. And then yeah. I asked him if he knows how to swim. And he's like, yeah, kind of. And it looked like the doggy paddle. I'm like, hell no. Oh, you ain't drowning yeah. both of us. Yeah, so yeah. I went to go up to the front desk to get swimmies. And Sid's going, Coach, I don't want to wear the swimmies. No, I, I, it's humiliating. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you're like, I'm I don't like, want you to drown either. No. And I said, Your big ass will drown both of us. Yeah. You're not going in the pool. I seen you swim a little bit. Not happening. We're going to put the swimmies. Well, make a long story short, this, his arms were too big to put the swimmies on. So we get, so yeah, so he couldn't get into the pool that day. Here, a couple of days later, we're at a bar restaurant eating, having a couple of drinks. Sid's with us. And the, it was one of his health coach and his swimming coach from high school. So he gets talking. He goes, oh, I, you know, I didn't know Sid knew you guys. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, he trained with us, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, yeah, they used to call him anchor in school. I go, <laughs> anchor? He goes, oh, yeah, he would dive in the pool and go right to the bottom. We have to go in and get him. <laughs> I was like, I looked at Sid. I said, you never told me that. Yeah, yeah, you could have mentioned just, that. What the which is funny is a couple of days prior, we went, we were going – I was going to put him in the pool to swim. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, my it's just God. crazy. Yeah. Could have lost Sid. But you could have told me about the anchor story. He's yeah. like, ah, coach. Yeah. I mean, I was in high school. Yeah. Like, doesn't matter. It was three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It was something like that. Three or four years. Yeah. Yeah. Man. That's, yeah. I mean, but, but anchor. Yeah. But that, no, but yeah, I would love to get just more. But I, I want to get more people from the different black belts and stuff. I would love to just get like a, an episode just with one guy, you, me, and one other guy, and like just talk about their progression to getting their black belt, like Daniel Bill or JR or, oh, you know, Padilla, like oh, anybody yeah, like Padilla. P, oh, Padilla's been on the show a couple so times. Padilla's He's one great. of the guys that I said he should have. He should go out on his own and have yeah. a school. He was one of those guys. Has a skill and can teach. And he could teach. Look, yeah. you have to have a personality. Yeah. Teaching is a whole nother art in itself. Yeah. There's many good instructors out there. One, if they're really good, they have no patience for teaching. No. They just don't have the patience. That's what makes Henzo a rarity. The other thing is you have to have a strong emphasis on the basics. And it's your job as the instructor to make that part of it fun. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then you're building a foundation and engaging. If you're, if you're introverted and you don't like to talk, that could be complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, Um, you have to be a lot of animated with your, your personality and and that keeps people engaged. You're very monotone. You know, it could, that could create problems. And I think that that's where there's a lack in some of it. People are good. 
Yeah, they know how to teach. Yeah, but, but they're Napoleon Dynamite. You they, know? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Can they get it across? Can you get it? So I think personality plays a big part. There's a Great. lot of little things that come in. Great. Yeah, and some, I mean, that's a whole, I always tell people, just because you got your black belt, I mean, you really, if you want to do this, you should mirror another black belt teaching classes. All my guys come from within, Yeah, you know, and they've spent, yeah. And that's you know, on both sides. On both sides. Yeah. Early on, I would bring them in. As I noticed, they started to have an interest. They were good at what they did. They had all the attributes for teaching, personality, can yeah. convey, could speak well, articulate. Yeah. That the stuff that you would need um, and can work with anybody. I start bringing them in as a helper. Yeah. And typically like jujitsu, purple belt, somebody over here, boxing, kickboxing, three, four years, they're yeah. consistent. Boom. And they have, to, and I start bringing them in. Now they get comfortable. So you can't go from zero to a class with 50 or 60 people. Nope. You're going to literally freeze and be like, oh, fumbling. Yeah. So it's a comfort you're level. Not make it exciting, but no, it's, yeah, you're, so that, that comes from within. And I always say, you know, I've been successful um, because of the people around me. It allowed me to be successful. You know, like Uncle Greg, um, Greg Hoke when he was here, yeah. JR, yeah. um, Isaac. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a bunch of people yourself. Pidia, uh, one of you Pidia, Pidia, Harry, Josh, 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 really, uh, Josh really James so. Medberg yeah. when he was Danny, here. Day, like I said yeah. Josh Josh Waller, uh, yeah. and it goes on and on. Yeah. And there's probably a couple people I'm missing here, but they allow me to be successful. Because if I got to travel or step away, you guys are running the show. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But people are used to some of your classes. Yeah. Like I always said, like I might be teaching a morning class in one day and teaching a night class the next day, and then over here teaching a boxing class the following day yeah. or, you know, or vice versa yeah. um, or kickboxing. So being able to have guys that I trust the, the members know and trust, that's a huge part. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier on me when I travel, but I think it also helps you become successful um, because people get connections with them and go, Oh, wow. I really like them. So yeah. We want everybody to be successful. Yeah. We want you all to be successful. Yeah. And I think too, it, it just helps with the community. Yeah. yeah. Even with Enzo, as, as successful as he is, he always said it's everybody else that, that helped build that, that house, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, he, he was giving us and we're giving back and, and then expanding and, and, um, you know, yeah. I think that's the way you look, you're, you're going to be successful that way, but it's a good, it's a good way to be, um, yeah. you know, having solid people around you. Yeah, I agree. So, all right. Well, Rich, thank you so much. Nah, pleasure, buddy. Great. Karen, thank you so much. I know you guys can't see her, but Karen's here also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's a, she's been playing. Well, there's things that she remembers. I. She's got the, I mean, yeah. you know, come on. She's the star of the show. Kind of, they did yesterday. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're asking like, me about 20 some years yeah. ago. I'm like, oh, I was like, what were we talking about an hour ago? Yeah. yeah. You know? So I don't know. this has been another episode of the Working Perspectives Podcast. I'm Matt Lavelle. He's Rich Lada. Yeah. She's Karen Lada. We're at, and we're at the Henzo Gracie PA Academy in Hatfield. In case you're wondering, you can find all our stuff and all our content on all podcast platforms and YouTube at Work Perspectives Podcast. You can us on Instagram at Work Perspectives Podcast. You can join us on Twitter and TikTok at Working P Pod. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, email us at workperspectives.gmail.com. Also, in the description of this episode, we'll have links to the Henzo Gracie PA Academy Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube channels. So, if you'd like to be if you'd like to be a member, contact us at the gym. We'll have the web, uh, website link in there also. We'll also open up other locations in Hatfield or not Quaker Town. Lehigh. Lehigh Valley. We're not meeting other Hensel Gracie schools. And there'll be other Hensel Gracie schools, more Hensel Gracie schools coming, coming soon in Quaketown, Lehigh Valley. So watch out for that. All that stuff will be on the socials, and the links for that will be in the description of this episode. This has been another episode of the Work Inspectors Podcast. Thanks for listening. Stick around for the ad read. Thanks. See you.